people say that they can't really have a view about the economy because they're not economists. And one of the things that I suggested in that speech was that we might establish some kind of way of uh, showing that ordinary citizens, thoughtful citizens, can get their heads around economic concepts, can challenge what they hear from people and can explore economic uh, ideas. Now, normally, when I give my annual lecture, uh, my colleagues at the RSA very wisely ignore almost everything I say, but uh, this particular idea was taken seriously. And so, for the last year, we've been working on the idea of the Citizens Economic Council, which is what we're launching tonight. The 21st century is presenting us with a range of complex challenges which we need to rise to, uh, to meet. So whether it's potentially devastating environmental degradation, huge demographic shifts, migration around the world, uh, or just the disruptive social impacts of technology. More than ever, we need to have good quality policy making. But we perceive that the narrowness of economic debate is holding us back. More than half of you, so that's a clear majority, believe that any citizen can have a say about economic goals and how they are achieved but they need to be informed. To have an open and transparent and mutually respectful conversation about the complex and controversial issues that they are engaging with. The Citizens Economic Council will bring together 50 to 60 citizens to engage in a similar process about the complex issues that face our country from across the UK. With a little bit more information, and it doesn't always have to be that much, you can shift a conversation from being very superficial to one being much more advanced. And I believe that that is vital for us holding politicians to account more effectively, as well as making far better decisions as a nation. You would be surprised the number of members of parliament who don't feel able to take part in debates as much on, the, on economic issues. If we assume that citizens don't understand a certain area of knowledge, what we, what we tend to then do is assume that deficit means that if we can only get them to understand that GM crops are actually quite safe, or that um, it, following this ac um, economic policy will mean this will happen, then actually they'll just agree with us. But the problem is that actually there's no right answer in public policy. It assumes that there are certain types of expertise that are acceptable in the debate and other kinds of expertise that aren't. And what it means is that the kinds of expertise that citizens have about their daily lives, about their environment, about what their needs are, the needs of their community, is somehow secondary to this elevated academic expertise. As I say, if there are no right choices and we elevate one form of evidence over another, what we end up doing is framing the conversation in the, in the wrong way. What I really wanted to campaign about was monopolisation by Monsanto about the supply chain, about what it meant for small farmers, but that wasn't the debate I was allowed to have. Um, and the debate about GM is a debate about economics, ownership, who wins, who loses. How do you frame the debate so that expertise has its right place and citizens have an opportunity to have a proper voice? One of the methods we're going to use in the council is, is a kind of method of, of getting people who disagree to work with each other to identify exactly what it is they disagree about. I totally believe that ordinary people can learn about economics because that's my personal experience. Um, we've actually got the lowest level of political engagement. That's people who vote, people get engaged in things in the whole of the developed world. And I think that's no coincidence that actually there's really huge levels of inequality and there's really low levels of political engagement and I think those two mirror each other. In the, implicitly, in most dialogue, what we hear that the goal of the economy is growth. But actually, we are destroying, we're now consuming in between 1.6 planets and 2.5 planets. I'm interested in your view about this question about expertise and citizen engagement uh, and the degree to which also actually your own work, I mean, you bring objectivity to the discussion. Do you think it's an important part of what you do to try to make it more accessible to people as well? The last month has been probably about the most depressing of my um, sort of professional career um, in the sense of the, the quality of the debate around the stuff that we work on and indeed the extent to which it was misused and the extent to which we were abused. Uh, it's very difficult to pick out those elements of the debate which are trustworthy and accurate and those that are forecasts and those that are lies. To some extent, what the debate was about um, as we came up to the referendum was actually at the core of economics. It was about a trade-off. It was about lots of things. But let's say it was a trade-off between economic growth and income on the one hand and immigration on the other. We know that immigration 
is, uh, it's, it's not an alternative to economic well-being across the country. It is good for economic well-being. Now, it has distributional effects to some extent, and a lot of the discussion actually here is about distribution as well as about averages and, um, and totals. Uh, now, we at the IFS talk a lot about distribution, and economics ought to be fundamentally about distribution, but this issue about trade-offs, I think, is actually absolutely at the heart of economics and economic debate. So there's a, there's a dirty secret in the Whitehall, in the Treasury, which is they, they, they absolutely know how to get more economic growth than we have had, okay? And they decide not to, and they decide not to because they implicitly make a trade-off that they don't really want to have a discussion with the public about. So how would you get more economic growth if you wanted to? And I'm not saying you should do this because there is a trade-off, okay? You would build an awful lot more houses, and that might well be public public house building, and you would build it in London and the South East. And that would be good for growth, absolutely for sure. Uh, but it would take up land and it would, uh, it, it, would, it would create environmental issues. You would build more roads. For sure, you would build more roads. We know for sure that that would be good for growth. But again, there is a trade-off. You would stick a third hut runway at Heathrow. Again, um, there, is, uh, there is a trade-off. Uh, you would probably liberalise a bunch of competition and labour laws. But again, there is a trade-off. And that is the, um, that is the sort of trade-off uh, that you need to have. So what seems to me is that the key of this discussion with citizens, in a way, is about those trade-offs. What is the trade-off between keeping promises to pensioners uh, in terms of uh, their occupational pensions and state pensions and so on, and the fact that that absolutely means that people below pension age have less income? What is the trade-off between policies on housing, which mean that uh, owner-occupiers who have a right to expect their housing value to you know, um, not be taxed or whatever, how do you trade that off against the, the rights or the needs of younger people? The first poll is pretty straightforward. Please uh, give the answer that most closely reflects your confidence level. So one, I'm an expert. Two, I'm very confident. Three, a little confident, but I could be more informed. Four, I'm not sure, it depends on the issue. And five is going to Homer Simpson option. Uh, I don't feel confident at all. Not many of you, it has to be said, uh, basically a lot, a less than a third feel either expert or very confident. I'm reminded when we asked this question that actually 73% of people think they're above average drivers. I think that's a kind of standard distribution, isn't it, Paul? Isn't that what? <laughs> it's a very normal distribution. Yeah, thank you. Good, I've got that. What are the goals of policy? We're going to give you seven options. There we go. You don't really care about internet access. Uh, you've all got it anyway. Interestingly, you don't really care about growth. So basically, none of you agree with the government's economic strategy, because that's entirely based on growth. Uh, safety and security is quite important to you. A cleaner, greener environments are pretty important to you. Having enough money to live on. The basic, now, interesting the relationship between that and growth, of course, be interesting. Better homes, schools, and hospitals. There you are. Public fabric matters a lot to you. And in the end, a more equal society and less poverty is the thing that matters most to you. Anyone want to say there was something missing that ought to have been on that list? A cohesive and tolerant society. Happiness. I would prefer economic development rather than economic growth. Growth might be like cancer, obesity, steroids, right. which is much of the current economy. A sustainable society to hand over to our grandchildren. And I think they're mostly all interdependent. You have to have growth to do everything. You have to have economic prosperity to do everything. They're all predicated on the idea that you have to have money and that money is the recognised means of exchange and that there's no other way of organising the economy and that there's no other way of organising what we need to live. Um, gender equality, because that has enormous implications for economic growth. Clearly, certainly over the 1980s, across the population and since then, particularly the top 1%, we've had growth... Uh, but uh, increasing um, inequality. I'm pretty delighted by this, really. I think that that really shows that the assumption that it's all about growth isn't really shared. Well, not by you people, so... And actually, if you look at constitutions and the beginning of the preamble of the Magna Carta and the Charter of the Forest, it talks about the Commonwealth, the common good, and I think we've lost that. Maybe we should have an expert's pledge. And the expert's pledge should be, I pledge always to acknowledge when I'm talking, giving my view as opposed to when I'm giving my expertise. And if experts signed up to that pledge and get, had more humility, I think the public debate would be, would be one element of a better public debate.
If you want a more equal society, well, would we be prepared to give up a lot of our wealth directly? Would we buy into a taxation system that was more redistributive? I've met businesses that have had contracts turned down because the speed of their broadband in the heart of a city that isn't London isn't good enough. It will be very interesting to see how that might shift with different demographics and around the country and whether people then interpret these questions for themselves or they interpret these questions in a very values-driven way. The Citizens Economic Council will be selected to be as diverse as it possibly can be. So although it will be qualitative rather than quantitative in terms of numbers, we will get a sense of people's different perspectives. So what we wanted to achieve today was to demonstrate that this conversation is a fascinating conversation that people want to get involved in. We only wanted to scratch the very surface of what is going to be a two-year debate. It was only afterwards that they did focus groups and they found that about 25% of the population thought that it was literally a penny on income tax. And so, um, uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you for your questions. But can I just ask you to join me in thanking our wonderful panel? Thank you.